Hey everybody, Jason here. I hope you're all doing really good. So today I'm gonna to be working on an iPhone 12 Pro Max PCB that was sent here for long screw damage. To the untrained eye, this looks just like any other iPhone 12 Pro Max PCB. I view these boards as somewhat of a work of art. I mean, for goodness sakes, look at how many connectors they have managed to cram onto this board, except, uh, they didn't include a connector for the 5G antenna now, did they? So the problem with this board, as you can see, it is missing a screw hole here. It is, uh, it seems to have like some sort of a hole here where it's not supposed to be. And if we look really close, and I mean really close, you can see that it's like somebody's tried to put a screw into that metal shield maybe? Let's look at this under the microscope. So then, here we are looking at the power button connector. And if we look right on <laughs> over here where we uh, used to have a screw hole, we can see that this has, this has been thoroughly removed. And you can see once this screw hole was peeled from the board like a, like a hangnail or something, they proceeded to actually try to what looks like make a brand spanking new screw hole right down here beside it. I mean... So what other sort of carnage here do we have? Gosh, I hope NAND is okay. It looks like, oh geez, it looks like we might have had a screw ran into the NAND, right? Oh goodness. So then you can see we have had some screw smushing here on the shield. And then we also have this screw hole here. Now this one has the appearance of prior repair. This one looks like it has had some scratching. It's had some digging going on. So let's go ahead and get this sticker off of here. I'm just gonna flood this with some alcohol to help this peel off there just a little bit better. So let's get this one out of the way. And you can see once the alcohol has some time to, to work, this stuff peels right up off here very easy. All right, let's see what we are up against here. I just, I cannot imagine that this board, there's a third screw hole <laughs> Are you kidding me? There's a third? There's a third? There's a third screw hole. Oh. My. Goodness. What in the actual total holy? I'm starting to get a little bit concerned that after I fix this. So this was sent here as logic board only. I did not get a housing with this, which means after I fix this, I'm depending on somebody else, possibly the same person that did this to reassemble this into a housing. So this looks a lot like the iPhone 6 plus long screw damage days where the board actually peels, you know, it's like peeled away from here. And you can see just consider on the main screw hole here. This thing is like, for the love of all things holy, that is, that's a couple of layers deep. And then we've got this over here going on. I mean, do you think there's a chance that this board will still function? And then having a look at the other damage down here, this has definitely went through the initial ground plane layers and we've got like, I don't know. I'm going to say that's like a, a snaggle of a trace or something snaggling around in here, right? Isn't that like a snaggly bit of a piece of trace or something? I think it might be. Against my better judgment, I am going to go ahead and check and see what, what sort of symptoms we get here. I'm going to hook this up to my DC power supply and see just what kind of a load it gets. I'm looking at swapping this over to a replacement board and due to Apple's security, in order to swap this over to a replacement board, I have to hold back the vital components that are necessary to retain this, to retain this thing's identification. And also because this customer is most likely interested in data, the only way I can get them their data is to do a full board swap. So, my concern here is that I'm going to go through all of this process only to uncover the original problem, which may be a situation where they don't get data and then this customer is not going to be happy about that. 
So let me see if I can tell at least something. I'm gonna hook this up to the DC power supply. I'm going to connect it right there. Turn the power supply on. And now to prompt this thing to boot, I'm just gonna slip right on over here and pull the boot pin to ground. Oh, look at there, we get an instant 1.6 amps. It's off, it's looping. So this thing is actually looping at 1.6 amps. Oh, tricky case. This case is tricky because the 1.6 amp load there, that could be like the original problem. That problem, that 1.6 amps, that might be what caused this board to get royally screwed over, like literally screwed over, get it? If they're after data, I might be able to get this to boot if I find the original short. Let's just have a glance at it with the thermal camera, okay? Power supply off. For this, I'm going to be using a Seek Compact Pro with the macro lens on it. So here we are looking at this with thermal imaging, and I've got a sneaky feeling. Now this, guys, this, this is dangerous. If this customer is after data and this 1.6 amp load is happening because somebody pounded a screw through the logic board, we could be getting 1.6 amps because our VCC main voltage is heading right on off through a low voltage line or like, it's a tough call. So let me just see if I can tell where this load is at and I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time with this and we're just gonna move for a swap. So then, looking at the thermal image, I've got the power supply on. I'm gonna go ahead and short our two little power on pins here, or our one little power on pin. Okay, we're at 1.6 amperinis. And... It looks like uh, we got heat coming out from under the NAND, but the bulk of the heat it's right there next to NAND. Is this, did somebody mutilate this board over a NAND short? Let's have a look a little closer, shall we? This is kind of a, a shot in the dark really, but my experience with long screw damage is that there is pretty much always another problem. I mean, it could have been the screen, you know, maybe this thing just had a broken screen or something and it got long screw damage while somebody was trying to fix the screen. Uh, these lines actually look fine. I'm gonna go ahead and check them with a meter. So with my meter in diode mode, I'm gonna put my red probe on ground and I'm gonna use my black probe to do the probing. And on these lines, we are getting a 0 0.42, 0 0.27. These are normal readings. So there's a significant chance that this is a, an internal short with the board. Plus aside from that, this board is absolutely mutilated. I mean, if this customer is after data and I continue to try to power this thing up, that only goes to lessen the odds of this having a fully successful CPU swap. So let's just get this started. The first thing I'm going to do is separate the board. So then for separating this board, we're gonna need to get rid of some of these annoying stickers. There we are. And then on the very top of the board, we've got this sticker that sort of covers up and shields everything. We're gonna to need to get that out of the way. And I normally put it back on there nice and pretty, but this one has been mutilated already. So we'll just see how that goes. Man, oh man, how hard do you have to push? All right, now we also, we need to go ahead and get rid of this sticker off the bottom of here because it tends to melt and get really, really crazy. Plus these boards take a lot of heat to separate. And if we have a barrier between the bottom of the board and our hot plate here in a minute, then that is gonna cause more trouble getting heat to flow into the bottom of this board. So I have all of the stickers removed. I've made somewhat of a brief evaluation to be able to tell that somebody has like punctured holes in this. It's time to get this board taken apart. So starting with the iPhone 12, Apple has changed the alloy that is used to join the board layers together, with the exception, I think, of the iPhone 12 mini. Uh, but anyways, this board here, it has a much higher melting point than the sandwich boards before this, like the iPhone 10, the iPhone 11. Those boards, you can just 
heat them up a little bit, they easily separate and you don't have to jeopardize like all of the other components floating. With this board here, we have to push the temperature so high that if we're not careful, we're gonna cause the CPU to float. We're gonna cause balls to pop out in places where they're not supposed to. So to be really careful here, this board has to be heated very evenly. And it, in my opinion, it requires the same skill to lift a CPU that it does to separate this series of logic board because it's almost the exact same thing. You're trying to heat it completely evenly and flip it off of there without tearing a bunch of stuff up. So here this board is on the heater. I'm gonna let it sit here and heat up for a long dang while. And then I'm gonna come at it from the top with hot air. Get in here with my precise thermometer. Eh, it's not quite hot enough yet. I can still hold my finger on it. Let it keep warming up. All right, so we are pretty well up to temp on the bottom side here. I'm honestly, I don't know if this board heater would even completely float this thing loose. I don't think it would. So now I have got my hot air set on 340 degrees C with an airflow of 40. And I'm gonna begin warming the board from the top side here. And I'll take short little breaks. And what I'm looking for is just a opportunity to see when my blade will go in, which I think I'm almost there already. We're just trying to heat this thing up very evenly and increase our chances of not floating the CPU or anything loose. Although I think I'm full swapping the CPU on this one anyways. And as the blade starts to go in, I'm gonna to begin to rotate it a little bit. And this board will begin to separate for us. There it goes. And I've switched to my larger blade, so I have more rotation. And there we go, a nice clean separation on the iPhone 12 Pro Max sandwich board. Oh, and I missed it. it. Went up out of frame, dang it. So then, now I have this board separated and it's time to have a closer look here. For now, I'll just set the bottom half of it aside because we are absolutely planning on reusing that. I don't think the bottom board has anything wrong with it, right? So having a look under the microscope here, this is pretty well what we expect to see on these iPhone 12 boards when they come apart. Um, we've pretty well oxidized almost every single pad here on the top board, which we don't care too much about the top board right now, do we? The bottom board has fared pretty well as far as oxidization. And I like to see these flat spots on top of the solder that holds these boards together because that means that I separated this with pretty well the bare minimum heat possible. And we shouldn't have any trouble with uh, stuff caused by my heat. So then the top board, what is actually wrong with this thing? Why did they long screw damage it? Did this phone have a broken screen? Did they take it apart for a battery replacement? These are all things I should be asking when I take the device in for repair. So let's see if I can tell where that hot spot was. Uh, this thing had a hot spot creeping right out from underneath the NAND right there in the corner. And I don't like seeing that directly on the other side of the board is the, you know, that that's the CPU. So. I'm hoping that there wasn't something shorted and causing part of that CPU to get hot. Um, our hot spot might have actually been caused by the uh, shield here as well. You know, just out of curiosity, and because I don't want to do a bunch of work that's not going to work out, I would like to see if this problem still exists with the top board only. So with the top board only on, or with the top board only hooked up, I'm going to short this thing and tell it to boot, and we are getting still 1.7 amps. So here we have the thermal camera on the screen. What I'm gonna do is boot prompt and then flip the board over really quick so we can see the bottom side. All right, we have a boot prompt, 1.6 amps. Okay, and here's what we get. Everybody paying close attention. We're getting a coil 
followed by a pulse coming out of the CPU. That is a very, very bad sign. I've just paused my video so I can see exactly which coil that is getting hot. And I'm gonna track this down on the board. And that is the coil right in the center. That's gonna be this one right here. So if we have a look at that, I'm gonna use ZXW tool here. And let's see, that was right next to the main PMIC. This coil right here, PP1B06S2. So it does in fact look like um, our little 1.6 amp thing is uh, a rather ugly problem. Where does that actually go? It is definitely a CPU related line. So, okay, well, I'm not gonna waste any more time trying to figure out what is wrong with this board. I'm just gonna go ahead and swap the CPU over to a known good board and see if this thing will power up. To be absolutely, completely, totally transparent, this is a repair that right now I should call no fix on because what I'm seeing from the thermal signatures is that this has a significant chance of being a CPU level fault. And if the board was broken in half and missing a huge chunk, like that would be a definite yes. But with the symptoms that I'm seeing here, I've got a really, really eerie feeling that we already have a CPU fault, but for the sake of this video, and because I really want to share this process with you, I'm going to go ahead and continue with this and see if I can get it to power up. So here we go. Back under the microscope, I'm going to start warming this board up. I'm using my large nozzle. I've got my hot air set at 250 degrees C with an airflow of 65. And I'm gonna to try to warm this thing up to where I can just start carving away at the glue. Apple was nice enough to glue these chips down to the board nice and firm. And I do have to say, I have seen that it does lessen the chances of things breaking loose when there's an impact, but it also makes it a little bit more difficult for guys like me and you and many of you watching this video to do what it is that I'm getting ready to do right now. A little bit more, not not impossible, just a, just a little bit more. So I'll just keep carving away at this until I get all the glue carved out from around the CPU. And you know what? This is actually a pretty lengthy, long drawn out process here. So I'll probably speed this part of the video up just a little bit. Or I might leave it in real time. What do you think? It's almost hot enough to be doing this. And I've already scratched the board there a little bit more than I'd like to be scratching the board. Now, one cool thing about this is that you really have to be careful on the donor board. When it comes to carving the CPU off the original board, be careful not to break the CPU, but you can completely, totally mutilate the board. I still try to make it look pretty, though, because the board I'm going to send back to the customer. And... Um, if the recovery is successful, it's not that big of a deal. Like that board can look like total hell. But if you're sending it back not recovered and you're sending them back with their original board looking like hell, well then you are setting yourself up for a one-star review. So on the donor board, whenever I prep these boards, I actually, I trim around a lot of the surrounding components to try to give me less chances of having things that are gonna swell. But on the customer's board, I don't pay much attention to that. Like I'll often use some of their components that are around this CPU to fix my donor board because um, sometimes I've knocked some loose. But other than that, we don't have to make, make this board to where it'll work. It'll be fine just like it is. By swapping the CPU and using a method of just going to a known good board, I have been able to increase my success rate by many. And also I've been able to accept recoveries that I would normally have to turn away and you know ship elsewhere and recommend people overseas. So that's, that's felt pretty good. I had a, an iPhone 13 Pro this week that, whoops, cut in the wrong spot, that had a dumbbell dropped on it. And the, the dang thing, it pushed one of the standoff posts all the way through the logic board, but it didn't damage the screen. 
is the dangest thing. Imagine me explaining to the customer that I know your phone looks perfect, but the logic board is absolutely destroyed. It punctured a hole all the way through the logic board. I'll shut up about that one because I'm planning on making a video out of that one day. All right, go, go, go. Now nah, this board's starting to get hot. The board and the holder has to get hot. And the hotter it gets, the faster you can work with cleaning this glue off. Okay, just about got enough of that glue cleaned off there so I can work. I have used the absolute worst part of my board holder for this. I need to be able to get to that CPU. Alrighty. So then, once we have the CPU all trimmed around, it's really important to make sure the board stays hot because we need the whole entire area to be hot. And then I'm gonna switch my air over. I'm gonna go ahead and use, I'm gonna use 350 degrees C with an airflow of 40 and keep moving, make sure we don't tear anything up. All right, so while being sure that this board stays hot, I'm gonna just keep swirling my hot air around the CPU here, keeping the air spread out as even as I can. And I will start to pause at the corner. Not anywhere near hot enough yet. And uh, we'll pause at the corner and see if my blade will go in. Circle, 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 pause, see if it'll go in. And then um, I don't always choose the corner. It's just a matter of convenience in this case. All right, here we go. Nope. I actually moved this board on my board holder. Normally by the time I'm done cleaning all the glue, the whole entire platform's heated up. But right after I cleaned the glue on this one, I, I moved the board. So now I'm stuck waiting to heat this whole area up again. All right, let's try again. Yes, looking much better. There we go. So I just get the blade in a little bit and I'm going to give it a, just a light bit of tension over here and get that CPU to raise up a tiny bit. And just as it does, I'll pull the blade out and then I'm going to choose another spot. Let's get in over here. Let's get it right in the middle. Okay, I'm gonna raise my air up some. I think the temperature of this room is a little cooler today. I'm gonna go up to 370 degrees C. Come on, baby. Any minute, that CPU is going to start to lift up for us. There we go. Keep the heat on, flip it over. Remove the heat. Now, at this point, I like to make sure that the CPU stays right here where everything's hot. To me, in my mind, these things are made out of glass. And I just, I don't pick it up immediately and let it get exposed to the air out here. Because right here, we've got this ambient bubble of hotness around this CPU and it'll crack. I just, I, it'll crack. It'll be like putting it in cold water or something. So I like to try to let it uh, cool down a little bit slow and then, you know, gradually work it away from the area here, slowly moving it away from the hot spot and let it cool down slowly. So this one looks like it's probably about half and half as far as how much glue is left on it. I really like when they come off of there and there's like no glue left on them, but uh, this one does have quite a bit of glue. So there's what our CPU looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and just put that aside in a safe container here, right there. And I'm gonna put that out of the way. Now also on this side of the board, I'm gonna be transferring the NFC IC, which is this one here. And we are gonna need the Logic EEPROM, which is this one right here. And you know, thankfully the Logic EEPROM is larger 
on this model, but nevertheless, I'm gonna wait until last to transfer those smaller chips over because um, the Logic EEPROM is, it can be really easy to lose. And with that one, I like to just straight off the board and directly onto the other one. I don't put it in no temporary. Anyways, let's get NAND off of this, shall we? So I'm just gonna start carving away at this. Same thing as before, 250 degrees C with an airflow of 65. Does anybody wanna place any bets as to whether or not that 1.6 amp load is still gonna be there when I get this entire job done? Not quite. Once it's hot enough, this happens really easy. This glue will just come out of there. Sometimes in one big chunk, it'll rake right out of there. I would really, really like to say thank you to the companies that sent me these CPU swapping tools. And I talked about, you know, I think I made, poked a little fun, like how I would never be doing this. <laughs> you know, I just, I got those tools a little bit prematurely and I had to grow into them. So here's me growing into them. Oh, look, I got the board a little too hot. No, that's not what that is. I had a little piece of low melt stuck down here and it made me think I had overheated this board because as hot as I got it to remove the CPU, I still don't think I popped any balls out anywhere. I think I did a clean removal. All right, go, go, go. And again, if this was the donor board prep here, I spend a lot of time cleaning out around these components just to make sure that um, everything sits and can float nicely. It's also why I have largely started keeping my donor boards. Once the recovery is complete, I take the customer's chips off and I keep my donor board because I trust it. And I have a 13 Pro board, or no, no, a thir yeah, 13 Pro board here that's now getting ready to go on its third recovery. It's awesome. All right, so that pretty well has the NAND carved around. And I'm gonna go ahead and switch my hot air over. We're gonna do 350 degrees C with an airflow of 40. And just continue to warm this up. I'm gonna be trying to get my blade to slip in anywhere I can, you know, over here, over there, whatever we can do. Either way, we will look for a clean lift and also look for clear symptoms here that uh, things are starting to melt. Okay, blade's going in. Oops, Nand is coming up. Ching, pops right off there. Nice and pretty. And again, I'm letting my Nand cool in the ambientness of this board instead of pulling it away and letting it have the air conditioned air from behind me hitting it. Okay, so we have Nand removed. Um, CPU is removed. The next thing I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna go ahead and clean up and reball the CPU, clean up and reball NAND. I will pull and reball NFC. Um, yeah, here we go. So then I'm gonna put the customer's board aside. What do you say we go after that CPU clean up and reball first, shall we? I'm going to put the NAND in here. Snag that customer's CPU. Now for this, I use a hot plate. And since I don't have a proper hot plate, I use this hot plate. And it's got one clean area here. That's where I'm gonna put this CPU. Actually, let's put the bulk of the glue out here. Now, I'm not gonna lie. This is the most tedious, difficult, worst part of the entire process to get through and be successful. I am trying to remove this rock hard epoxy that is embedded between lead free solder balls. This has to be done without putting so much as a single scratch on the CPU or there's a significant chance that it won't work. So it's actually a pretty tedious process to, to make this happen. 
And I'm gonna start by warming this whole thing up extremely hot. And I'm gonna be using the same hot plate that I use to separate the board, but in the future, I'm planning on going with like something more like this hot bat, a, a smaller hot plate that is fine controlled because you really need to be able to control your temperatures and, and, and push this right up to where your alloy melts and then start to back off rather than this thing. I don't know what its temperature gets at. I just sit here and flip the switch off and on like this. It works fine. To get this process started, I'm going to take me a blob of low melt, which this I think melts at 138 degrees C maybe. I want a pretty decent sized blob. That ought to be plenty. As our beloved CPU starts to warm up, I'm just going to start touching it with this stuff. I want to coat the entirety of this thing in this stuff, and I don't want it to start balling yet. because I want to make dang sure I get it everywhere. And this is a wooden toothpick that I'm using to spread out my paste here. All right, so that is actually, that's looking pretty marvelous. So how about that, all this using a tiny little toothpick to put a little dot of flux on there, and then you get to sit and watch me smear solder paste all over the entirety of the whole entire project. Now, whenever I say entire project, let me just, this is a standard issue, United States five cent nickel next to my entire project. Here it comes. There's a nickel. All right, so any second here, the solder paste is going to begin to melt. And what that's going to do for me is it's going to start to dilute the alloy that's already on the CPU because I need everything here to melt at a much, much lower temperature. Um, what will happen if I rake across something that's not melted is it's going to tear a pad off, off, off of the chip. So having this hard metal alloy stuck all over this thing is actually a, a pretty bad thing. We need to soften that up some in order to be able to get this glue off of there because I have to clean the glue off of it. And if I have hard metal in the way, it's gonna be an absolute disaster. Oh, here we go. We are starting to melt. And as that does this, this alloy will actually combine and dilute the other alloy that's there. So I'm gonna leave the burner on and I'm gonna come at this with a tool. Um, a tool that I once was, at, you know, I'm on YouTube making fun of this tool. It has now became one of my most widely used and appreciated tools. And um, it was donated to me pre prematurely. I mean, I just, I had to grow into these tools, fellers. All right, now I'm dealing with a little bit of an issue here because my tool is a little bit cold. And as it touches the individual balls, I can feel it, you know, it's making a, it's, it's cooling them. So I'm just gonna continue just like puttying this around here and making sure that this gets onto everything. Some of these balls, it's not diluting. I can, as I rake my blade across it, I can feel that some of those balls are still hard. And I'm gonna go ahead and take my 2032 micro pencil um, and start floating around on this. So we'll add some flux. And it also makes a really good tool for cleaning this glue off. So does flux. Flux takes this glue off really well. So I'm gonna use my micro pencil to be sure I don't have any hard balls left. and just make sure everything has been combined with this low melt. 
And the low melt I'm using, it melts at 138 degrees C, I believe. I mean, it's, it's quite a bit lower. And you can see a lot of that glue is just, it's coming off already just from my iron going past it. So that's good. I was really hoping that most all of the glue would stay on the board for this video, but you know, that that's not the way the universe works. Now, is it? All right, I think I've got the bulk of the crap alloy off of here. And now I'm gonna start seeing if I can peel up some of this glue very carefully. Another risk here is the uh, solder can, if you lift your blade up, it can cool. And then when you sit your blade back down, you've got, you got hardened solidified solder. Yeah, this is, uh, this is not a good one to be doing a video on. This one's going to be a pain in the neck to clean up for me. Now, once I get the bulk of this glue off of here, I'm gonna switch and just start using a cotton swab. It is really stressful using this hockey stick looking thing, but it does a really good job. I mean, this has became my favorite tool for this. I think when I first unboxed these, I'm like, I guess I'll use these for prying on stuff. Like, golly. Talk about getting my tools too early. I was nowhere near ready to do full CPU swaps. I am now though, I'm loving it. Well, within reason. Once I get the glue off of here, I'll be loving it again. This is the most stressful part of the whole entirety of everything is cleaning this crap off of here. Now, if you are an absolute master, and you would like to offer me advice, I am well open to suggestions. Um, I've had all kinds of things suggested for cleaning this glue off of here. Um, magical liquid and things, but I never have tried anything that just makes it dissolve. Um, not like heat. Heat softens this stuff right up, and I can sit here and just squeegee it off the board. 
And it don't have to be perfect, it just has to be good enough to survive reballing. And you gotta be able to get a leave, even layer of solder on there. It don't have to be perfect. That's what I'm saying is that you can have some glue left over. It'll still be okay. Oh, serenity now. How I wish that the glue would have just stayed on the board. I did an iPhone 13 Pro the other day and all of the blue glue stayed on the board. I was like, oh yes, thank you. Okay, I'm almost ready to switch techniques to a technique that's not quite as stressful. This here is pretty stressful. If you turn your blade the wrong way or twitch or get a little bit irritated or for some reason somebody made you mad two or three days ago, it's pretty easy to damage the CPU. This part stresses me out. So let's switch to a cotton swab. Standard issue Q-tip. Here we go. Lots of heat. And lots of flux. Flux cleans these things very well. It's also really important to remember not to panic. So we're gonna put just a tiny amount of flux on there. There we go. And as this flux does its work, you'll see everything bubbling. And the flux does a very good job at removing the leftover glue. And if I pick that Q-tip up, I'm going to flip it over and use the other end because the heart attack that you have whenever you realize that you just put a scratch across a handful of pads is just, it's awful. Okay, spin it. Use my blade a little more over here. Everything's gonna be just fine, folks. This is all completely normal. I'm sure Apple meant for human beings to be swapping these CPUs from board to board. This was all part of the plan. All right, let's get just a little bit more flux on here because the first time wasn't enough. There we go, just a tiny bit of flux. And while that does its work, I'm just gonna wipe on it. Now, the cleaner you, you get it, the easier it's gonna reball. Like I have literally cleaned these things up very little before and they'll still reball, but um, you'll have, it'll give you more trouble with things being even. I'm about done cleaning this one, honestly. But if I don't clean it really good and it makes the reball difficult, then I'll look like an idiot. So let's clean it up a little better. Yeah, it's really important right here to not have any lead-free alloy left on the board because it'll it'll hang up on your tool and it'll tear the pad off. And see right now, if you look really closely at what I'm doing, you'll see that all of the metal that's on this board is molten. So I can clean without getting caught on it. Pretty nice little trick. All right, one more flux treatment and then I'm gonna to switch to alcohol and get it cleaned up. So we're gonna put, again, the smallest amount of flux possible. There we go. And Q-tip that off of there. 
Yeah, it's way too hot to use alcohol on it now, but Flux works really good at these temperatures. A couple more little pieces that I think are going to cause me problems. I think it's good. All right, so burner off. Let's let this thing start cooling down. Now, while this is really hot, I am going to go ahead and start lifting it up off of here because that flux that I'm using, it's tacky. It'll get really hard to pull that off of there after a few seconds. So I'm going to pick that up off of there. And then again, I'm going to be holding it in the ambience of heat. Now that the chip's cooled off, it is okay to use some alcohol on it. And I'm going to be using alcohol to remove my flux and also possibly any little bits of glue that were left over. Um, I'm sure there is some solvent that would make removing this, the, the rest of this glue really easy, but it's okay. I mean, it really is okay to have the tiniest little layer on there. When you look across that chip, it's just that tiny little bit of stuff that's been left there is most likely not gonna cause me a problem as long as I'm using dry paste. I'm more worried about Q-tip fuzz than I am uh, the tiny little bit of leftover glue that's on there. All right, so that is looking pretty stinking good. Let's get some new balls on here, shall we? Let's see, I really like these mechanic UFO stencils. Um, it comes in a neat little booklet, and this is everything from really old to really new. It has uh, all the way up to iPhone 13 on it. And I'm not being paid to say that either. I bought these. iPhone 12 series. And it's musical. Hmm. I don't know. It is a little grungy. Let this be an example that it does not have to be completely clean to work. Okay. Let's just, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay. That's looking pretty good right there. So I'm taking 6337 leaded solder paste and I'm squeezing it into a napkin. All right, now that I got me some paste dried, drier, I'd still like it for it to be a little more dry than this since I'm leaving some glue on there. But here we go. Let's get us a blob of solder paste on here. Okay, that's pretty dang evenly spreaded. Now with my hot air set on 340 degrees C and an airflow of 40, I'm gonna begin warming this up. And I'm also, I'm gonna begin warming up the entirety of the whole stencil because this one will go through a little bit of a flexing process before it comes up flat. I'm not sure it might have just did it. Okay, here we go. Dang, that was a little intense. It clunked down flat right after it was hot. I hate it when that happens. Okay, now all of the balls did not drop, so I'm going to add some flux to this and heat it once more. I 
And this is going to take care of, uh, you know, oxidized pads and areas where the solder didn't want to stick before. This flux will take the oxidization off and get the balls to stick. So then, what's this one? There we go. All right, let's let this cool down because it should be good. Now, I am using tacky flux, which means this is going to set up and get hard really fast. So it's very important to pop the CPU out before that happens. There we go. We have a nicely reballed CPU. I'm going to float it once more just to make sure there's not anything fishy going on. Sometimes it'll look okay, but it's not okay. Oh, and it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So there you have it. We have a nicely reballed A14 CPU with beautiful, symmetrical, non hairy leaded balls. We'll take this refurbished CPU and sit it aside back here in my container. And I'm going to do the same thing to NAND, only NAND is a little bit less stressful. We can just go to, go to town on it and clean it up. So. I'll set it right on the same hot plate that I just used for my CPU, and I'll do almost the exact same thing on it. Um, this is not nearly as tedious as what I just went through on that CPU. So basically, all I'm going to do is add some flux here and then wick it, um, and then I'll reball it and go. Um, I'm out of wick. I normally use larger wick, but I'm out of it. So let's use this tiny little wick, which will work probably better. Oh boy, that was a bad idea. Let's add some alloy to that anyway. Let's just go with some of this. There we go. That'll work. That's leaded. Well, nothing to see here. Everything here is completely normal. It's normal to totally flood these things with leaded solder. Okay, now we don't have to have uh, everything cleaned off so we don't have to wick it. I was just trying to look good, I guess. All right, so I don't think we have any glue left on that on this NAND to start with. It actually looks pretty stinking clean. Yeah, that's ready to reball. Good to go. All right, so again, we're going to clean it up with some isopropyl alcohol. It's really important to not have a bunch of flux in the way whenever you're reballing these things. The flux will just cause everything to run everywhere. But once it's solidified enough where it's done running, then you're good to go. All right, that is ready for some brand spanking new balls. And since I already have some dry leaded paste, I don't have to do that this time. All right, let's get us some fresh paste in here and uh, move right along here. All right, we've got it pretty well smooched full of paste. Now with my hot air set at 340 degrees C with an airflow of 40, I'm gonna go ahead and start warming this up. And we're gonna float some nice, beautiful balls. Okay. 
Let's pop it out of there, add some flux, and float it once more, shall we? There we are. Let's just get a little bit more flux on there. And heat until shiny. Slowly. Okay, so I have the NAND and the CPU reballed and safely stored inside of this container. It is time for me now to go ahead and do the, ow. It is time for me now to go ahead and do the smaller ICs. I'm gonna do the NFC IC first, and then I'm gonna do the Logic EEPROM IC. All right, so let me get my grubby little mittens on this NFC IC first. And I'm at 340 degrees C with an airflow of 40. Now I'm not too concerned about like really overheating and screwing this board over right now because it is about to have literally nothing on it that I need. That is after I'm finished with that Logic EEPROM IC. So warming this right on up, I'm gonna grab NFC. I'm actually not even sure if NFC is necessary anymore. I'm sure you can just like update and get around it now, but I'm seeing that people may not be transplanting that at all. So, okay, there's NFC and I'm gonna reball it and then come back for this EEPROM. So for that, I'm just gonna reball it right here on the bare table. Works quite nicely. That looks like a perfect match right there. All right, here we go. Warm this right on up. Drum roll, please. Uh, balls. There we go. This should actually be my last reball, not counting the bottom board to uh, put the sandwich back together. Um, but this actually should be my last chip to reball for this entire project. It's just marvelous. All right. So now, let's go after the Logic EEPROM whatnot. Um, but to begin that, I'm gonna start with warming up the board because I'm gonna put my new NFC IC on my donor board and then I'll worry about EEPROM. All right, let's get this on the board. That was actually sitting so perfectly that I, I didn't even notice that it was floating. All right, now, here is one of the most tedious things. This EEPROM, if there is anything that is gonna fly across the room on you and never to be see again, this is it. It was a lot more difficult whenever they were smaller. Um, previous models had much smaller EEPROM ICs, but nevertheless, this is still uh, and the previous ones were much easier to break too, but this is still really tedious. Not as easy to break, not as easy to lose, 
but I like to get right a hold of that and don't do anything else with it. I slide right over and sit it down on the board, except I did not notice that my donor board had a really screwed up ball. Isn't that lovely? I've got one tiny little ball. Actually, they're all, all screwed up. Let me just smooge these off a little bit. And we'll also mix the, um, the lead-free stuff here that's on the board. We're gonna be mixing that with some of this leaded. Well, it's easy to tell who ground is, right? Come on. I just need some nice little humps on these. That's looking pretty good. All right, we'll set that on that. This will work. Barely. Okay, and let's get this thing in place before it flies away. And believe me, it will eventually fly away. It's just a matter of time. And I also like to have it sitting in plenty of flux to do this because that makes it sticky and it's harder to fly away. Here we go. All right, that's got our EEPROM in place. Okay, next I'm going to put um, NAND on here and then CPU will be last. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get some flux in here. Okay, so that's going to sit down in there right like that. I do see some shorting I've created during my prepping of this. It's not real pretty. Hopefully that's okay. I'll have to fix that. All right, let's get this NAND down in here. Okay, any minute, it's gonna drop down into place. Almost up to temp. Goes, again and again. Okay. Okie dokie, so that has NAND in place. I'm ready to flip this thing over and slap the CPU on it. And then uh, we're getting ready to find out what happens, right? Sweet. Cannot wait to know if I've just did all of this for nothing. Or if one of our Nice little screw holes was causing this thing to have the excessive load on boot prompt. We are getting ready to know all of the answers to those questions, folks. This is going to be amazing. All right, here we go. Ow. I underestimated the temperature of this board. And I wiped it with my bare finger. All right, wipe the rest on my pants. Okay, we're ready to sit a CPU. And I'm going to look at how this lines up. I actually don't need to worry about pen one because we have all these nice little things that sort of line up Goonies style. So we can take our CPU just like that. 
and then lay it down on there. And it's going to go just like that. All right, I've got it pretty well lined up there. And now it is time to start warming this board up. I'm going to be holding my air pretty far back here, fellers. I've got my air set on 340 degrees C with an airflow of 40. And I'm trying to just gradually warm this board up. For many of these, I actually don't even use the microscope. I just hover over it and stare at it. I sort of watch for flux to kind of bubble out the sides. And um, I need to get some bent nozzles, honestly. That would help me here. I do it like this mostly to get straight down airflow. I'm going to get the whole entire board warmed up, and then I'll switch back to the microscope for you. The final component here to see if this thing has a good CPU. All of this just to find out if the CPU is good, really. Okay, switching back to the microscope. We're going to be watching very carefully for this CPU to drop. Wound up with some Q-tip fuzz on it that I couldn't pull off because it would have misaligned the CPU. That's okay, we'll worry about that later. All right, we should see some flux coming out of the edges here any moment, fellers. And if we don't, that's okay. That means I precisely estimated the amount of flux that was going to be needed. You know, sometimes these drop and I don't notice. Is that what happened? I don't want to overheat the PMIC. That'll cause me a bunch of extra work. CPU, are you floating? No, I'm underestimating my heat. Just now bubbling. All right, we are almost up to temp here. Let's see if she's floating. Almost. Oh yeah, she's floating. All right. So I got a nice little snap back, which means this thing is most likely on the board, but sometimes it can be floated a little crooked. So I like to go over it just one more time, nice and close up, straight down. Good. Ah, okay, so we have transplanted, by we I mean me, the CPU, the NAND, the Logic EEPROM IC, and for some crazy reason, we transplant the NFC IC. So while that board cools off just a bit, I'll go ahead and clean up my stencil for next time, which will be like tomorrow. I'm doing, I don't know, about three per week, full swaps. I'm pretty excited for it. Um, a lot of these jobs would have no solution if I wasn't able to just take the guts and put it on another board. And um, one of the easiest ways I've found out now to decide whether or not the A15 Bionic CPU is good is to just put it on a board you know is good. Voila, done. All right, we're not working on A15 Bionic today. We're working on the A14. I've got raging anxiety over this because this is the point where you've went through all this work and now get to find out if it was all for nothing. So first I'm going to hook up the DC power supply, make it so you can see it on the screen. I'm going to turn the supply on and I've missed vital steps all along the way. When I'm doing this all by myself and I'm not worried about moving tripods and lights and trying to make sure you can see everything that I'm doing, I would have checked this board for current after almost every component that I installed. But here I am, I've installed everything. Here we go. Oh yes, no current draw. That's a good first sign. And we're gonna prompt this board to boot and see what we get. Hopefully it's not 101.6 amps. That'll be frustrating. That'll mean we have the exact same problem as what we started with. Here we go.
And there you have it. Oh wait, you actually don't have it. You're disconnected. You don't have it at all. The, the power supply is not working. 1.6 amps, 1.7, it's slightly different. 1.67, 1.67. It's normal for it to be a little different after the CPU's been heated and tampered with. Um, I suspect that this is either bad RAM or bad CPU. That's, that's what this is gonna be. I'm gonna look at it with a thermal camera just to match the thermal signatures from before and now. And um, that'll tell us a lot actually. So let's hook up thermal camera. All right, we've got our thermal camera going. Let's get our boot prompt, boot prompt going. 1.6 amps exactly once it's cooled off. No coincidence there. And I bet you, I bet you, yeah, our thermal signature is identical. Oh, what a bummer, dude. That is such a bummer. Ah, no. Anyways, that's a failure, um, sort of. I mean, what I've done here is I have taken a known, go a known good iPhone 12 Pro Max board and I've transplanted the brains from the customer's board and I've basically confirmed that there is a problem with the customer's CPU or, or the RAM. Um, wow, what a bummer. All right, everybody. Well, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot more time on this video because that is like, oh man, that, that really hurts. That really hurts bad. But I really thank all of you who still subscribe to my channel, especially after not posting the video for like four months. But um, for the last four months, I have been really hammering hard on my CPU rework. I am successful now at everything from the uh, A10 all the way up through A15. I've actually done, a, a, I mean, a significant pile of them. And um, that's why I know that this isn't my fault. This is actually somebody else's fault. So gosh, one more thing before I go. One of the most important things that I have learned about this level of rework is actually knowing whenever it's your fault. For example, my last two board transplants were for I iPhone 13 Pros. Um, one of them was, I don't know what happened to it, but the whole board was twisted real bad. And the other one simply had a dumbbell dropped on it. And long story short, I did the one that was twisted real bad. I did it first and I came up with a, a brain dead CPU, like what the heck? And everything went perfect, like no missing pads, just cannot figure out what in the heck. So what I did is I took and I removed that customer's chips from that board and I put them in a safe spot and I went ahead and proceeded with the next iPhone 13 Pro, which was dumbbell phone. Well, dumbbell phone actually had a hole punctured all the way through the logic board. Like it didn't break the screen. The screen assembly was fine and the back glass was fine, but it had a hole punctured all the way through the logic board where one of the screw standoff posts was and the dumbbell hit it. Um, but anyways, I did the same exact process on that, the same routine, got the data, no problems. So after that, I took that customer's chips off of my known good board, put the previous guy's stuff all back on there, and I was right back to having the, the brain deadedness. So I guess what I'm getting to is that if I hadn't have done another one right after that, and probably a couple of dozen or more now before that, I wouldn't have known that that one wasn't my fault. So um, it's really good to know like what's supposed to work and what's not. And I just moved the problem from one board to another and it's the CPU. So anyways, guys, that is gonna be it for this video. I really thank you all for watching. Thanks for sticking around and um, I'll see you really soon. Have a good day.